And now we start the, the, the second lecture. Okay, so um, in the second lecture we're doing here now that we're talking about the security definition and um, a, a tool that we call, we call a quantum proof front on six tactiles. Okay, um, so first kind of informally, uh, what does it mean to prove security of a QKD protocol? <coughs> So if things go sufficiently well, okay, so if we don't detect too many errors, for example, we would like to produce a key. We don't want the protocol to abort. In this case, we want the keys to be identical uh, for Alice and Bob. We want them to share, um, to end up with the, same, uh, with the same keys. And this is something that we call correctness, okay? So for Alice and Bob to hold uh, the exact same key. We want the key to be unknown to Eve, so it should be a secret key, okay? Um, and in addition, if things don't go well, okay, so if we if we detect too many uh, too many errors, if the adversary is too active, then we would like to, to detect it and to abort the protocol, okay? The combination of these two things, of the key being unknown to if, if we produce the key and um, otherwise aborting, detecting and aborting, this is what we call secrecy, okay? So if we abort, obviously um, there is no key, everything is fine. And if we don't abort, then we want the key to be unknown to if. Okay, so the combination of these two things is secrecy. Um, the correctness and the secrecy together, this is what we call uh, the soundness of the protocol. Um, and this, the, the next thing that we want is that we want a protocol that can be implemented. Okay, so maybe in contrast to kind of classical, the classical setting, um, um, sorry, this is called completeness or, and also noise tolerance. In contrast to the classical setting where completeness basically means, okay, here we, you know, here is a protocol, it solves the problem. Here we don't just need to be able to solve the pro problem by giving you a protocol. We also um, we also want to be able to implement it in practice and actually produce these keys. And these are because we are talking about quantum devices. This is not it's not trivial. Okay, so um, we call the, if if a protocol can be implemented um, right now or in the future, <coughs> this is what we call complete, completeness. Okay, so these are all the things that we want we want to um, to achieve. Okay, but this was informal. How do we make it formal? Um, and <coughs> what I'm going to um, to show you is uh, what we call. We're going to use uh, the concept of composable security in the in the quantum uh, in the quantum setting. So, um, just kind of intuition. Uh, what do we mean when we say composable security? Um, maybe some of you heard of it, about it already in the classical case. Um, but if not, then this is um, this is what I'm talking about. So, let's say I have um, protocol one. Um, and this, so there is this uh, particular protocol and there is a quantum side information of the adversary that is just floating around and we prove that this protocol is secure. Okay, so that's, that's good. Um, and now let's say there is a second protocol doing something else. Um, also there is this quantum, um, quantum adversary, some quantum side information. We prove independently of the first protocol, we prove that this uh, protocol is secure according to some definition. Okay, what do we want to have, you know, a property that is kind of, um, somewhat necessary, um, we, want, we want to believe that if I prove that the first protocol is secure and the second protocol is security, secure, so also when I combine the two protocols together, I, I, you know, I, I run one after the other or in parallel, um, then I want this to be secure as well. Okay, I don't want every time, if I, if I don't have this property that we call the composability, then it means that if I, you know, it's okay that I prove that this one is secure and that, that one is secure, but now when I combine them, I need to prove security um, from scratch. Okay, so this is something that I don't want to do, and this is what composable security um, refers to. In the quantum world, this is um, <coughs> sorry, this is a bit delicate. So, you know, when I looked at the first protocol, I had this this quantum state here, um, and when I looked at the second protocol, I have this quantum state. But you know, when I analyzed the, the first protocol, I didn't even have in mind that I'm going to um, to to connect it to the second protocol. Okay, um, but when I'm talking about the combination of these two protocols, then um, these two states can be entangled, for example. Okay, so it's, it's very important that um, we define things correctly such that indeed we get in the quantum world this, um, this composability, the fact that if, okay, I prove that my QKD protocol is secure, then I prove some other um, quantum protocol is secure, then I can also combine these two things um, together. Okay, so this is what composable security is about. Um, Okay, so, so I'll say about, uh, talk about a bit about this composable security. Um, we are going to use a, a framework which is called abstract cryptography. Um, and then I will show it is, it's actually equivalent um, to a different security definition, which is very useful uh, to use when we actually prove security. 
Okay, um, so as I said, we are working in a framework that is called abstract cryptography. Um, and this is a complete mathematical framework. So you can see in the, in the references that, that I provided, you can see some um, links to the papers. Okay, so this is a complete mathematical framework. I'm not going to, to, to describe um, all of it. Um, there is, by the way, there is a, also in the, in the reference um, PDF, there is also um, a link to a tutorial uh, given by Christopher Portman that explains uh, these things in, in, uh, in much more depth. So you can, uh, if you're interested, you can go and watch that tutorial as well. Okay, so I'm not going to explain everything. I'm going to kind of present some important steps. Um, so the first thing that we will need to do is um, we will model uh, the ideal system. Okay, what do we want in the ideal case to, to have when we're talking about distribution of a key? Um, then the second thing we're going to do is we're going to identify uh, the resources that we have when we uh, construct a, our real protocol, our real system, um, and model the real system using them. And then we're going to talk about the quantum distinguisher. Um, this is kind of um, <coughs> an object that will try to distinguish the, uh, the real from the ideal system. And this is what will allow us to define uh, security if we are able to distinguish these two systems. Okay, um, and this, this approach, the most important thing about this approach is that it gives us a precise description of what we achieved. Okay, it's kind of clear once we define the ideal system um, and we say, okay, we cannot distinguish the real system from the ideal system. It's clear what we, um, you know, what we're saying, what the statement is, um, and that's very important. So in the past, um, weaker security definitions for UKD were used and no one, no one even noticed, okay, because it wasn't kind of phrased in this, uh, in this way. So what is the uh, ideal key, okay? This uh, ideal key distribution um, resource. Um, so you can think of it in this way. So I have here basically um, this, in this abstract cryptography, everything I will have these uh, nice abstract figures. Um, so I have this box here, okay? Um, and this box, it, it has um, several interfaces. So we have Alice, Bob and Eve, okay? And we want this in the ideal case, what we want is we just want you know, a key to be produced and sent to Alice and Bob. So let's say Alice and Bob can ask for the key and then they will get it. So um, we just have key here to Alice and the same key here to Bob and we don't want Eve to know anything about it or let's say anything but the size of the key. Okay, so um, the size of the key here uh, will be a L, L bits um, and we want it to be <coughs> the ideal keys uniformly distributed over um, this L bit. So this is this notation here. Okay, so, so that that's, can be an ideal key distribution resource. Um, it's kind of maybe too naive. Um, so we can always have a situation when Eve just kind of stops the communication between Alice and Bob. Okay, so um, let's, we, we, cannot, we cannot escape this thing. Um, so let's, we want to model this also in the uh, ideal uh, case. So what I have here is, um, I have this, the, the, the thing that produces me the key. And then Eve can, uh, in this ideal case, Eve can input zero and one. And zero and one just tell, tells us whether a key is distributed or not. Um, so if she, if Eve inputs zero, then um, Alice and Bob just they don't get they they get this sign of kind of a board. Uh, they don't get the key. Uh, and if Eve puts one, then they, she lets the key pass, and then Alice and Bob get the key. Okay. So this is um, this is an ideal uh, key distribution resource for us. So now let's move on to the real system. <coughs> so what are uh, our resources uh, are, our building blocks for the, uh, for the protocol? So we said that we have an authenticated classical channel. Okay, so here I draw it in this way. I have, um, so I can, I can send classical uh, messages. So this is um, this M here from Alice to Bob. So we can send them in, in um, both directions, let's say. Um, and it's a public channel. So Eve also, um, Eve can learn the message. She hear, just hears uh, what it is so she knows the message but she cannot change it so Alice and Bob um, can still communicate without knowing that they got the message from one another okay so this is the authenticated channel okay um, and in addition we have this insecure quantum channel okay so this I can draw it this way so I have uh, Alice okay so let's say I'm, I'm sending a quantum state from Alice to Bob so I, I have Alice Alice can input a state Okay, but now it's an insecure quantum channel. Eve can just take this state. Okay, so Alice said, let's say Alice and throw this. Um, this is my, my qubit here. And Eve can now put whatever she wants. Um, she can put this row prime uh, here and this, this state will uh, now go to Bob. Okay, so this is an insecure quantum channel. Okay, um, 
Now what we have, we have these two resources and what we're going to construct is a QKD protocol. So these are these, um, these uh, squares here. <coughs> okay, so these squares, they're just like local operations that Alice and Bob can do, tell them how to um, use those resources, okay? Um, and this is the protocol this tells Bob here what to do. And then the output of the protocol is this, um, either we abort uh, or we have this key that was produced for Bob and the same for Alice. So either uh, we abort uh, or um, Alice is getting the key here. Okay, and this is everything that is available to Eve. So Eve can steal from the authenticated channel. She can read uh, the message and she can get here the state and choose what to put there. Okay, so this is the real system and how we produce it from uh, from the resources we have um, in combination with the protocol that we need to um, we need to construct or we want to analyze. Okay, okay. so this is um, this is our en entire uh, real system here. Okay, so kind of you know again um, informally, if we're thinking about distinguisher, this is I'm sure you've heard about distinguisher before. So the real system is um, we said it's secure um, if it's indistinguishable from the ideal system. Okay, so if these two systems look kind of the same, then uh, then we are happy. So we have this object of a distinguisher. Okay, so this is this um, this um, gray object here. Um, and the idea is this, we have this, this distinguisher that can um, basically, we give it either the ideal system or the real system. And this distinguisher can um, now do whatever, whatever it wants in all of the interfaces here. Okay, so it has access to uh, Alice, uh, Eve and Bob's uh, interfaces, for example. And what the distinguisher needs to do is to distinguish these two cases. So it needs to put to output zero and one, let's say that zero um, corresponds to ideal system and one corresponds to the real system. Okay, so the distinguisher needs to guess um, whether it got the, uh, the real or the ideal system. Okay, and we can define a distinguishing advantage, it's kind of a um, distance measure, which is basically you take the supreme over all distinguishers. So you're looking for the best distinguisher, kind of the smartest uh, way to distinguish these, um, these two systems. Okay, and this is um, you know, the probability that on the real system it outputs one minus the probability on, uh, on the, sorry, on the ideal system it outputs one minus the probability it outputs one on the real system. This gives us the, um, what we call the distinguishing advantage. Okay, um, so we you know here I, like, I, I have these drawings, but um, I take here a supremum. So there is, there is a way to formally define these things. So there is something called quantum cobs that, you know, take this quantum system and this is what you're um, uh, taking the supremum over. Okay, so there is a mathematical definition. Again, you can you can go to the to the papers um, in the reference list. Okay, um, a second thing which is very important to notice here is that there is no division to parties um, for the for the distinguisher. Okay, so if before I looked at you know I looked at these systems or I talked about the protocol and I had like I said okay there is Alice, Bob, and Eve. From a distinguisher point of view, the distinguisher gets access to all of these together. Okay, and this is this is very important um, <coughs> for composability. The fact that, that distinguisher can access all of these all of these uh, interfaces and um, decide whether it's the real or the ideal system um, using all of them. Okay, so um, so why? So for example, in our case, we are um, in this quantum uh, quantum case. The distinguisher is quantum. So if there is a quantum interface here, we can input um, a state. For example, then then we want um, the distinguisher can also do it, so it can use these interfaces interface for Alice to input a state, um, and another interface for Eve to input a state, for example. Okay, and these states again they have nothing to do with um, with with what Alice or what in the protocol um, Alice will send. The distinguisher can choose whichever state um, it wants uh, to output, and these two states can be entangled also. Okay, so it's doing the same thing when he's trying to, um, you know, the, the distinguisher doesn't know if it interacts with the real or the ideal system. So it will do exactly the same thing. So it can input the, um, these states here, which can be entangled and then see everything, see all the correlation, everything that we, that we see here in all of the other interfaces. And according to this, make a decision of whether this is the ideal or the real system. And the fact that it can do this, so this is in, you know, in the drawing that I had um, in the beginning, I had this protocol one, protocol two, and then I said, when I'm combining them, I you know, I didn't even think that there is another system. This is where it comes from. So the fact that the distinguisher um, doesn't have this division to the different system, but it can input also uh, entangled states in, in um, between uh, Alice and Eve system, for example, this is what um, allows us to get a composability in the quantum world. 
Okay, and another thing maybe which is important to note is um, there is no, everything is finite here. Okay, so when we're talking here about the QKD and the information security, um, you know, and I have a finite number of rounds in my protocol, there is no poly, no uh, negligible, nothing like that. Okay, so everything is, everything is, is, is finite in this case. Okay, so um, this is my distinguisher, and then I can kind of sort of um, define security by saying, okay, if this um, distinguishing advantage is small, then it means that the idea and real system are close to one another, um, and then it means that this, the system is secure. Okay, so this is like sort of um, what it what it means, um, and this is this is this is my way to um, to try to quantify if my real system is doing what it's supposed to do, and the ideal system is the thing defined to me what what is the thing that I'm trying to do. Okay, so um, what I said was kind of sort of and kind of slightly informal. So if we look at the ideal system and the real system, then okay, it's very easy to distinguish these two things. You don't you don't need to be very smart for that. Um, why the interfaces are not even the same? So distinguisher. If I give it the ideal system here, there is this zero and one. In the real system, we have this you know quantum channels and this this thing here. <coughs> the orange lines are the quantum channels now. Okay, so uh, of course this is not. Kind of the point when I really want to um, to to define this um, to let the distinguisher interact with these two system. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, define security by adding a, a simulator here, okay? Um, and this simulator it will have the same interface as here is the real system, okay? So something um, a simulator something needs to be done here inside. I will need to, when I'm trying to prove security I'm trying to find a simulator, okay? And whatever happens inside it should allow the distinguisher to have access to this. Um, to this the same the same uh, the same interfaces so uh, Eve here should have exactly the same interfaces here she should have the uh, quantum channel that, that that comes here the quantum channel she, she can put states here and this uh, authenticated um, the, the output for the measurement okay so now we kind of redefine our ideal system um, together with this simulator here and we will say the protocol is secure uh, if there exists a simulator if we can construct a simulator such that distinguishing advantage between this ideal, this new ideal system together with the simulator uh, and the real system uh, is small. Okay, so again, this is still not the complete state and we need also to take um, into account the completeness part, but, um, but okay, this, I, I leave it aside. Okay. So um, as I said, like one very big advantage of, of taking this point of view of the abstract cryptography, composable security, um, it's very clear what we're what we're proving. Okay, so when I say that this this distance uh, is small now, it's clear. You know, this is my real system. It's clear what my ideal system is. So I know I know what the statement is. Okay, I know what I'm trying to to reproduce, which behavior I'm trying to reproduce here. Okay, um, and as it turns out, this is equivalent to another uh, another statement, another security definition that um, was used also. <coughs> In the past, and it's very, it will, as you will see, it will also be very useful for us when we prove security. Okay, so um, before I show this equivalent, uh, this this other um, security definition, are there questions now? Something important now? Mm, we have just one one question. So mm -hmm. um, you are asking if the if Eve can uh, somehow tamper with the interface of. Uh, of uh, an honest party, for example, Alice, or whether the honest party, um, yeah, whether that, that that's part of the model or not. So, so it depends. I mean, there there are two things to kind of distinguish here. So, so it, oh, distinguish. <laughs> it depends if I'm talking about the distinguisher, or if I'm talking about like when I'm when I'm looking at it from the point of view of of having just these parties. So, so far in the previous lectures, I really talked about. Um, I, I said there is Eve, there is there is uh, Alice, there is Bob. And if there, you know, I, I clearly said she can, you know, she can act in this, um, she can put the quantum state there. Okay, but I didn't let her, um, I didn't let her touch Alice's, like look at Alice's uh, outputs, Alice's interface. But here I'm, what I'm doing here is that when I'm prove, when I'm defining security, I'm using the distinguisher. And the distinguisher is no, we, we should not think of it as distinguisher as being even distinguisher is a different thing. Okay, and this distinguisher has access to all of the interfaces at once. Okay, so the distinguisher can do whatever it wants with all of the interfaces. Um, maybe it can also, even before even inputting something here, the distinguisher can put, put something here. So there is no, on the distinguisher, there are no restrictions. And no, there is no, um, there is no, uh, where is my, 
Okay, there is no there is no division um, to these to these parties. Okay, so the distinguisher can look at Alice's um, interface and Eve's interfaces and Bob's interfaces. Okay, and according to this, make the decision whether it's the ideal or the real system. Okay, and, and so we are no longer talking when we're defining security in order to get a composable security, we're no longer talking about kind of what exactly Eve can do, but we're talking about distinguisher and a distinguisher has access to all of the interfaces. Okay, so the distinguisher and Eve are two different things. Okay, that, then uh, I have a question, if I may. <laughs> like, is there a theorem uh, that we can use or that says that if you if your protocols, you have two protocols, for example, and uh, you know if these two protocols satisfy some conditions, then you can compose them sequentially or parallel. Do we have some statement like that? Yeah, so this is this is um, so so when you walk in the when you walk in the composable security uh, framework, in there are many frameworks like this, but um, the point is is exactly this is exactly you want to come up with the right security definition, okay, such that um, if you prove um, that this thing holds, then kind of automatically you get that you can compose them uh, in parallel or in sequentially, okay. So the framework, this is exactly what the framework gives you. The framework gives you a way to say, hey, this is your way of defining, you know, take take a um, take a task. If you define your security um, using this kind of um, this kind of uh, language then you, you get a promise, okay? The, the framework tells you um, there is a proof for that, that you can compose it. If you prove security according to this definition, um, then you can compose them, okay? So that's exactly the point of walking with this, um, with, this um, with all of the composable security um, frameworks. Okay? Right, so, but, but, but mm -hmm. yes, Alicia, go ahead. Sorry. No, it, was it clear or not? Uh, I, I was just asking, so here, when you mean composable here, you don't put any restriction on the kind of composability, right? You don't say, you know, we want sequential composition. No, it can be parallel, mm, uh, concurrent. Uh, we don't, we don't put any restriction, right? Yeah, I, did, I don't, I don't, I, now I'm looking like, it's, now it's as if I'm looking at just as protocol one, right? But when I'm walking in this framework, then um, I'm basically kind of, you know, the people that develop the framework, what they told you is they kind of say, <clears throat> and they prove this. They tell you, look, if you're using this security definition that comes from this um, concept of the distinguisher in this particular way, um, then um, kind of rest assured that you're fine with composing them in whichever way you want. Okay? So, so someone needs to kind of develop this. Someone needs to say, okay, this is the security definition that you should use. Okay, but the point is that if you're walking in this thing, then you're kind of, I'm just now looking just at this protocol one, but because I'm walking in this framework, then it means that I can afterwards, you know, for whichever protocol two that you bring me, I can I can compose it in whichever way I want. So, so that's that's the point. The point is that we want to kind of have a framework where, you know, I'm now, I'm just walking on my QKD. I don't want to think about everything else. I want to walk just on my QKD, but I'm walking in the kind of correct framework, correct way, in order to um, to come up with a security definition that will make sure that afterwards, when someone else brings me protocol two, then I will be fine. Um, so, so that so that's the point. Okay. okay, I think that we can proceed. Okay. <coughs> okay. So so the definitions that that come from the these composable security frameworks. They were also shown to be equivalent to another widely used definition, which is the kind of trace distance definition that I will show in a second. So if you recall our informal definitions, we had these things. So we said that we want to have identical keys, that this was the correctness part. Um, if we produce a key, we want it to be unknown to Eve, or uh, if things don't go well, we would like to detect it and abort. This is the secrecy. Um, together, this is soundness, and we have that the protocol can be implemented. This is the completeness. Okay, so. Let's kind of try to put it uh, in equations. So now I'm starting to have like many epsilons. Um, so a protocol, you can think of all of these as, as constants. Okay, so a protocol is um, is epsilon correct. Okay, if we said correctness means that uh, Alice and Bob's keys are the same. So if the probability that they are not the same in the end of the protocol um, is smaller than this epsilon. Okay, so you want this to happen with small probability. Um, now there is this, uh, the secrecy. So a protocol um, is, is epsilon secret 
if we have this um, this definite this uh, mathematical statement here. Okay, so let's try to understand what we have here. Um, so the first part. So again, I remind you this. Uh, okay, L here is the length of the key. So the first part. Um, this is refers to the to the case that if we kind of almost always abort, then the key is trivially secret. Okay, so we, we want to take into account the probability that if we abort, if the adversary just always makes us abort, then you know we're fine, we're secret. So that's the first part here. And the second part is the trace distance between um, two states that we can think of them as the real and the ideal system. Okay, um, I will explain in a second. Okay, and we want this we want this trace distance to be small. So Henry, Henry talked um, yesterday about the trace distance. Trace distance it's it's um it's a measure of um, distance between between two quantum states, um, and we want this to be small. So if these two states are uh, close to one another, then um, then we're good. So let me just say what these states are. So here we have um, the real state in the end of the protocol um, shared <coughs> by Alice and Eve. Okay, so this K A. This is the um, this is the, the the key that Alice is getting in the end of the protocol. This is what she holds. This is this register, and the E is the quantum state that that Eve has. Okay, it's everything that 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 Eve knows. Okay, so this is in the end of the pro protocol. We're not aborting. This is the state um, for Alice um, for Alice's key and and, and Eve. Okay. Then um, what we see here on the other side. So we have here its notation. Um, so this is a basically uniform key. So it's a state which is like the maximally mixed state uh, on L uh, on L bits. Okay, so it's just it's just a uniform key, okay, uniform distribution. And what we have here is Eve's quantum state. Okay, and as you see, we can have a tensor product here, which basically says again, this is kind of says Eve knows nothing about this. Um, uh, she's completely un uncorrelated. She's uh, she knows nothing uh, about this uniform key. Okay, about this ideal key. So everything that Eve can do is on uh, acting on her part of the system on this register Eve, uh, E, and it has nothing to do with this this thing. Okay, so this the combination of this thing. This is really the ideal situation where we get a uniform key, and Eve knows nothing about that key. Okay, so um, we see now that this is the distance between the um, between the, the the real and the ideal key, and we want this to be small. If this is small, then it means that indeed we're you know, we got these two systems to be uh, to be close. It's hard to distinguish them. Okay. Um, now there is um, just a statement: if it's both, uh, if the it, if protocol is both correct and secret, um, then it's it's we can just combine these errors and say, okay, it's these uh, two epsilons correct and secret. Okay. And now when we define security, then we have this kind of the soundness part and the and the and the completeness part. Uh, we say that the protocol, the QKD protocol, is like the, we have these different epsilon, the soundness and the completeness epsilons, and um, L is the is the length of the key. So um, it's secure if we have the soundness. So the protocol is um, the soundness uh, soundness L correct and secret, um, which combines combines both of these secret secret and correct um, and completeness. There exists a quantum device that can implement this protocol um, such that the probability of aborting is at most um, this completeness uh, completeness epsilon. Okay, so again, I don't want I can have a protocol that will just always abort, and of course it will be it will be secure, but it will not be useful. Okay, so ideally I don't want this thing um, to be um, to be large. Okay, so the probability uh, of, of yeah. Okay. So this is this is a this is a definition a security definition, um, and the important thing is that this security definition uh, was proven to be equivalent to the composable security definition that, we, that I showed you before. Okay, and this is what justifies using this definition. Okay, so if I want to I care about composability, I should start with this uh, abstract cryptography with this composable security definition. Um, but then there is also this other definition. It turns out that these two things uh, are equivalent. Um, and this is why I'm also allowed to work with this other uh, other security definition, okay? And if I don't do it, if I don't show that these uh, that the security definition I'm using is kind of equivalent to a composable definition, and then things can go wrong. Then when I'm trying to compose um, to, uh, protocols, it can things can get messed up. Okay, so um, now that we know that this is equivalent to the other definition, the composable definition, and I want to continue to work with this uh, with this definition now. Now. 
the hardest part when um, proving a security of a protocol is to prove that this uh, distance between these two quantum states um, is small. Okay, so this is the most challenging part. Uh, and this is, um, to, to achieve this part, we're going to use uh, what we call a privacy amplification step, uh, if you know it from classical cryptography, um, but in the context in the context of quantum, um, the quantum adversary. Okay. Question so far, notation, is this clear? I have here. Um, okay, there is one question. Mm -hmm. uh, the probability to abort is taken over the distribution of what? Sorry, it was, it was, uh, can you please repeat it louder? The probability to abort is mm -hmm. taken over the distribution of, of what? Um, well, or everything that events? Everything that goes, uh, everything that goes inside the protocol, yes, yes, okay. randomization that goes inside the protocol. Okay, so yeah, for example, like choosing the basis or something like this. Okay. Thanks. Okay. okay. Um, yes. So what I want to do now is to show that this uh, this trace distance um, trace distances between the the um, the, the real system and the ideal system is, is small. Um, and for this, I want to show you how I'm actually going to construct this, um, this real system. And this we're going to do with this privacy amplification step, um, which is uh, directly related to uh, what we call quantum proof randomness extractors. Um, so again, this is now a step where I'm going to apply uh, a classical, classical function or a classical protocol um, to classical data to the raw data that Alice, uh, Alice holds, Alice and Bob hold. Um, so, but we still have the quantum adversary. So this is, this is kind of this post-quantum cryptography, information theoretic, okay? So there is no, there is no computational assumption on, on the adversary. You can do everything which is quantum. Okay. Um, this as well, I know I'll, I'll, try, I'll do it rather quickly uh, now. So I hope um, many of you are familiar with the concept of randomness extractors in the classical world. And there is also in the reference list um, uh, there is a tutorial that uh, Anon Tashma gave about this uh, uh, topic exactly. So also you can uh, watch it on YouTube, YouTube just, um, just something which is devoted just to this topic. Okay. Um, so we said in, the, in our protocol, we have this, this is just to remind you. So we have this, um, we, we generated the data, um, we measuring the quantum state, we're doing the sifting, we're testing, um, testing for, uh, for the L's and we are bought if we need. And Eve, um, in, Eve can listen to everything and she, can, she keeps uh, like all of her quantum states. So Eve has this, this register with the quantum, uh, all of her quantum information. Okay, and now we're not going to do classical post-processing. So we are doing, going to do classical error correction. So uh, we want the keys to be, this, to be identical. And we said that maybe we have these uh, additional L's um, in the Z base that we need to correct. Um, so this is done with classical error correction. Um, in, this is a, a proto, basically a protocol where Alice sends some uh, information, some classical information to Bob, and Bob uses it in order to modify uh, his key. And this information is available to the adversary because it's over this uh, a public channel here. Okay, and we have the privacy amplification, which is this um, extractors we are going to we are going to use. Um, the important part is that in both of these steps, Alice and Bob are exchanging this classical information here uh, in the presence of the quantum adversary. So she hears the information, she has quantum states, um, she can use this information in order to kind of try to extract information uh, about the key from her states. Okay. Okay, so in the privacy simplification step, um, let's say we have now uh, Alice's row key, okay, the row data. So these are these, um, this is sequence of bits here, and Eve has her quantum state. Okay, um, if you want to write this quantum state, we can write it as something that we call a classical quantum state. Um, so this is what we have here. Um, so it's a, it's a mixed state over uh, Alice's register and the, this, this row, uh, row data here and Eve's quantum state. So we can write as a convex combination uh, over all possible, uh, all possible uh, keys that we, that we can have here that Alice could achieve uh, in the protocol. Um, so we have here the probability for every key, um, very pos every possible key. Uh, here we have just this, um, this is just a classical state, okay? So it's, it's just, um, um, in, basically it's just these bits here. So it's in, in, the, in the standard basis. 
uh, writing this A here. And then, um, then for each classical state like this, Eve holds some information, some quantum state. So this is Eve's quantum state. And this state is correlated um, with, this, uh, with this classical raw data that Alice holds. OK, so any, any, this is just a general um, way of writing any classical quantum state. OK, so there is no restriction here. It's just we're just saying, you know, in the end of this stage, when, uh, when we're, trying, we're going to apply the privacy simplification, Alice's state, uh, Alice and Eve's state, joint state looks like, looks like this, OK? Um, what the, the important thing to see is really that, you know, this state that uh, Eve holds um, per A, it has some information about it. So, so for different A's, she can have different, um, different states. And this is, this is kind of what, where we see that, you know, it's not a tensile product um, on, the, on everything, but we can, um, Eve can extract information about A from her state here. Okay, so this is the, the correlations that, that we see between um, the raw data that, uh, that Alice has and uh, Eve's quantum system. And uh, our goal now is to get rid of this correlation. And this is what the privacy simplification um, is going to do. So what we want to get is we want to get to this ideal state, this tensor product state, where we have um, this uniform superposition over like every possible key. Um, and in the end, and this is tensor product with uh, Eve state. And you can see here, I don't have this uh, superscript. Okay, so here this is really this tens of this this uniform the maximum mix state over these uh, L bits and tensor product with a state for if that has no information about uh, the value of k. Okay, so this is what we want to get using privacy simplification. Okay, and uh, we're doing it with the quantum proof randomness extractors. Okay, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with randomness extractors, so I want to um, I want to say a few things. So um, the goal of randomness extractors is to transform uh, in the com now completely classical. Okay, um, our goal is to transform a large but weak source of randomness into a shorter uniform distribution. Okay, this is used in, in different areas uh, in classical computer science. Um, so if you want to kind of have this uh, in a picture, so a weak source of randomness, it's not a uniform distribution. It looks maybe something like this. So you know, if I have the probability for uh, for any uh, raw data A here. And this A is, um, is a string in 0, 1 to the n. OK, and different strings, they have different, um, different probability. And this is what we call a weak source of randomness. OK, um, and one full form of, of a weak source of randomness is what we call a mean entropy uh, source. So this is here we have, um, a, this, is, this is a definition. So a mean entropy of A, of a random variable A, um, is defined like this. It's minus log uh, the maximum uh, uh, the, the highest probability uh, for one of these A's. Okay, so um, a different uh, way of looking at this is this, um, we say that the mean entropy of A uh, is um, greater or equal to M. If for all of them, all of these A's, um, they're, um, the probability is, is, is lower than this um, two to the minus M. Okay, so this kind of gives us the upper bound, like what is the most, um, most probable item? We can think of it as, you know, if I ask you, um, to guess what A is, okay, then your guess probably, <coughs> I mean, the, the kind of smart way of guessing would be to just tell me what is the most uh, most likely uh, value for A. Okay, so this gives me this uh, this thing. This is the define the, the entropy in terms of like the guessing probability. Okay, so uh, again, the goal is to transform, to take this weak source of roundness, and in particular, we will use now mean, uh, the, the mean, uh, mean entropy sources. OK, so we have a promise that the mean entropy is um, greater or equal to m. And we want to take this and to transform it to a uniform distribution. So here, um, all, of the, all of the items for this k, um, they have exactly the same distribution. Uh, but this is, this is now smaller. So we, uh, we end up with l, uh, 0, 1 to the l. Um, well, we start with 0, 1 to the n, and n is larger. So we kind of take something which is not completely uniform, but has some entropy. And we're going to squeeze it to get something smaller, but, uh, but uniform. Okay, so this is our goal. Um, unfortunately, it's impossible to achieve deterministically. So there is no function that can start with a source, um, like a general source, when we only have this promise on the mean entropy and transform into a uniform distribution. Um, what we, uh, what happened here? Okay, so it's impossible to achieve it deterministically, but we can. what we can do um, is to add an additional uh, short seed, random seed. Okay, so I have here another source of uniform randomness in that case. 
Um, so this is a seed, zero, one to the D. And this is, this D is, is really tiny. So the goal is to achieve, to, you know, to start with a really, uh, really short seed, um, but then use it, um, apply a function on this, both on A and S, the seed, and then from this, get this uniform distribution. Okay, so this is what an extractor is doing. The extractor is taking this mean entropy source um, together with some additional independent seed, completely uniform, but very, very short, and use it to extract kind of the randomness out of this, uh, the mean entropy source and get this, um, this squeezed randomness. <coughs> okay, this is the definition of randomness extractor. So a function um, is called an extractor. Um, if when I'm starting with this uniform seed, and any probability distribution with um, this bound on the mean entropy, then what we get is that the output of the extractor um, together with the seed, so I'm talking here about strong extractors, um, the output of the extractor is close to, close to uniform. Okay, so the distance between the output of the extractor and the and uniform is this is uh, upper bound by this epsilon. Okay, so yeah, again, output of the extractor, here we, we have a uniform key, we want them to be, uh, we want them to be close to one another and here I have, so I included this S here. So I included the seed. Um, it means basically you can think of it even given the seed, even given the information of the seed, we want these two things to be close to uniform. Okay, and this is important. Um, it's called strong extractors in the classical world. This is important for us in the context of QKD because this seed is going to be um, made public. Okay, so um, Alice is going to apply some private, this extractor um, she's going to choose the seed at random to apply the extractor, and then she's going to send the seed over the uh, public uh, classical channel to Bob. Um, so Bob can also apply this, this the same function. Okay, so um, by doing this, by sending it over the public channel, then Eve also will know this, uh, this, this string, and this is why we need a strong extractor. So here in this picture, um, okay, so I have the output extractor, I have the seed, but I don't have any side information here of an adversary. So Let's say in the classical world, if people would want to kind of consider what happens when I have side classical side information, then I will change the, uh, the definition in this way. So I have now a probability distribution over A and E, also a classical adversary. So, so um, uh, information can be correlated um, to A. But now I have the conditional uh, mean entropy. Okay, so conditional information there, there, that we have in E here, uh, we want the entropy to be, uh, to be large. Okay. Um, so what does it mean? So now we basically, again, if you're thinking about the guessing probability, you kind of, you can think of, um, you know, now I have, I want to, I'm asking you to guess the value, the guess, to guess the output of A, um, but you also have access to this E system. Okay, so you can read what happens in your system and then from this, um, use this in order to try to guess A, so it can, um, it can help you. Okay, um, sorry. Okay, so now what I also want, now that I have this side information, my goal will be to say, okay, the output of the extractor, even given the seed and the information that adversary has, this, this E, um, I want it to be close to uniform and um, even given this, uh, from the point of view of the adversary, even given this E, okay? So if you, this comes from where, you know, the, the definition for the security that I showed you before. So this is what we want, we want to achieve. We want to um, this output of the extractor to be close to uniform, even given this, this um, additional register E. Okay, but you don't, I mean, those who are familiar with extractor, you, you never really see like classical proof randomness extractors. And the reason is that um, you can write this thing in terms of just expectation over the values of E, and um, then it becomes kind of trivial. So and any extractor with some a loss of parameters uh, becomes a class, is also a classical proof extractor. And this is why this is not something that is being like really re like actively researched. Okay, so you never you never really see it in the classical li literature. Okay, so um, in this sense, okay, classical sign information is kind of trivial when considering structures. And um, now we, of course, we want to move to the quantum case. So in the quantum case, I'm right. I, I don't have a distribution over um, A and E uh, instead in compared to the classical. Uh, um, case from a slide ago. Now I have this classical uh, quantum state that I showed you before. And my condition now is that I have the mean entropy, again, conditional mean entropy um, greater than the greater or equal to, to M, okay? So what here, uh, what we have here, again, A is classical, E is quantum, it's a quantum system, okay? Um, we can still define it in terms of guessing probability, 
Okay, so again, I want you to ask, uh, I, I, I want you to, uh, to guess uh, the value of A and you have access to this uh, quantum system E. And now you can make certain operations. So you can make, for example, you can, in order to guess A, you can make a measurement uh, on Eve's quantum state um, on, on, the, on the quantum state E and then use this outcome of the measurement uh, in order to guess A. Okay, so this is the definition of, um, of this guessing probability, which then defines as the a conditional mean entropy in the case of, of a classical quantum state. Okay, so um, maybe the exact definition doesn't matter. The point is exactly this, that you can kind of choose how to measure the, the quantum system, okay? <coughs> okay, um, and then what we want to have is we want to have this, um, uh, if this condition holds, so if we, we start with a classical quantum state um, with this conditional um, mean entropy um, greater or equal to m, we want the extractor to work. So what, what, do, what does it mean now? We have here, uh, again, the output of the extractor. So now this is just the quantum way of writing it, right? Um, we have here a state with the output of the extractor. So Alice took the, the, the register A, she took the seed S, she applied the extractor. So everything here is classical, this thing is classical. Okay, and we get a classical outcome. We have the seed and we have E, the quantum system. Okay, so the E is quantum, the rest here is classical, and we want this to be close um, to a uniform, okay, by definition of the extractor. Uh, we want it to be close to uniform, um, um, the maximum mixed state of, of L bits, so to the uniform distribution over this L bit state, ideal key. Um, and tensor product, a state uh, over the seed and if, so seed classical, uh, if quantum, okay, so if state is quantum here. And this is what we want, this is what we require from a quantum proof extractor. Okay, so if, if we have this condition and we say that the, uh, the extractor is, um, is quantum proof. Okay, um, now it's very important to notice here that E is kept quantum, okay? <coughs> so I want this distance, I want this, tra this trace distance um, to be small when I keep E quantum. So I don't make any measurement on Eve Okay, I really keep the quantum system. This is again important for composability because later I'm going maybe to use this uh, quantum system in a different way. Um, so here in this definition of the quantum proof extractor, uh, the system E is uh, quantum. Okay. Um, now, while the classical case was, uh, was kind of trivial, we don't really talk about classical proof extractors, the quantum case um, is not trivial. So it doesn't follow directly from the classical one. Um, and you, I mean, you can be happy or sad about it. So, so um, it means that when we when we have an extractor, if you want it to be quantum proof, we really need to analyze um, the specific extractor. Um, so, um, also you can see in the reference list some some uh, some extractors, like for example, a Trevisan extractor or universal hashing, they continue to work in the quantum case. There is a proof for that. You need to prove this. It doesn't just follow directly. Um, but some some extractors are not just are not quantum proof. Okay, so it's not um, it's not really related. It's a very important question where like there is a way of transforming transferring transforming from this uh, any extractor and to understand the behavior in the in the classical case. Okay, so that's a very interesting um, topic by itself in the, of quantum proof extractors. Okay, um, questions. No, or no. I think I think that uh, we don't really have a relevant question, uh, so maybe let's. Uh, okay, I continue. Go on. Okay, okay. So again, the important thing here: this thing, the output of the extractor is classical. I apply the extractor. The extractor is a classical function. I apply it on the classical uh, on the classical string that that the, the raw data that Alice has. Okay, so this is this is just classical operations, and only if here is um, quantum. So why did I tell you all of that? Um, well, this is how we are going to combine things together. So I told you that secrecy, um, which is the kind of the hardest part to, to prove when we prove the security uh, of a quantum key distribution protocol, um, is, <coughs> is defined with this, um, this kind of condition here. So we have a trace distance between two states, um, the real and the, and the ideal system here. Okay, and I told you before that in the Q, in our QKD um, protocol, we have in the end this privacy amplification step, which is done using an extractor, a quantum proof extractor. Um, so now we see how this, oh, sorry. 
So now we see how, how this can is going to, to, to work out, okay? So an extractor, what extractor gives me is exactly this condition that the output, so if I, if I now take the output of the extractor to be my, sorry, keeps jumping. If I now take my output, the output of the extractor to be my, uh, you know, my, my final key, okay, Alice's key, um, then the extractor gives me exactly this promise that I need um, in order to prove uh, secrecy. Okay, it tells me that the output will be uh, decoupled, will be will be um, in tensile product. I will get this uniform key, um, which will be in product from an adversary's quantum side information. Okay, so now what I need to make sure is that I can I can work in a situation that the extractor works in my protocol. Okay, so the extractor will work if I can prove that my uh, the state before I'm applying the extractor has enough uh, mean entropy. Okay, so um, this is what we will need to show now. We will, uh, our next uh, challenge, and this is the main challenge when uh, we prove the security of QKD uh, protocols is uh, really to show that um, this, this conditional mean entropy is, uh, is high. And once it's high, then, uh, then the extractor uh, the extractor um, works and we get uh, we get the secrecy, which is the hardest part. Okay, so um, this is the thing that we're going to do um, to do next in the in the next lecture. Okay. okay. Yes, so this is the, the end of this of this part if what has this now? So that's the, that's the Thank you. second part. If you have some questions, I can answer or... Sure, let, maybe let's take this one and then... Uh, okay, so um, why are we not considering Bob's state as well? Um, how are we making sure that Telis and Bob have the same key at the end of this process? Okay, so um, so so as I said, there are two... Um, so I can, I can... Can I go back? I'm sorry, I stopped sharing. Um, Where's my QKD protocol? Sorry, just a second. Okay. So uh, in the classical post-processing, there are two steps, okay? There is the classical error correction and there is a privacy simplification. Um, and this, these are two independent steps and they're both, um, they're both crucial. So um, the privacy simplification, what I told you so far, this was just to make sure that if um, doesn't have information about the key that we are producing. Okay, so this is one thing. <coughs> and this is the secrecy definition. And there is the other thing, which was the correctness, if you remember, uh, which, has, which says that classical error, uh, which says that Alice and Bob, um, they have the same keys. Okay, um, and this is what the classical error correction uh, step is doing. So I didn't explain how it works. So again, it's a classical, it's a classical protocol. Uh, basically what happens there is that Eve is going to, um, I mean, okay, there are different protocols, but one protocol is if is going to apply some hash function uh, on her her uh, data on the, the raw data that she got, then she's going to send some information uh, to Bob, um, and Bob is guy kind of trying to use this um, to use this information in order to um, to conclude what is the most likely key that she that Alice holds. So Alice and Bob's keys are not the same. Um, Bob will get some amount, tiny amount of information from, from Alice. We'll use this in order to kind of correct his key. And then after this classical error correction uh, step, they will hold the same keys with high probability, okay? Or abort if there are too many errors, okay? So this is, this is one step. And then let's say that we, that we managed to do the classical error correction, okay? Then Alice and Bob, they have the same state, the same uh, classical string now, okay? Um, so then the privacy simplification step, first of all, it means that if we will apply, you know, if we apply the same function, so the extractor with the same seed, um, then they will get also the same outcome. So we are fine also after the privacy simplification, they still have the same keys. Um, but also for the privacy simplification, because Alice and Bob's keys are the same, then, you know, it doesn't matter. We only want to make sure that it doesn't know the key, but uh, the key, Alice's key and Bob's keys are exactly the same. So we're just looking at, at Alice's key. Okay, so there are these two different steps here and they are, both of them are very important. Um, it's just the classical error correction is kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's easier, it's less, um, it's easier and there, there is less, the, the, the kind of the presence of the adversaries is less critical here. So this is why I'm focusing on the, 
privacy amplification, this is where we really care about. Like we really, this is the really delicate part. So maybe we have time for one last question. Um, do we impose some structure on a row uh, SE, for example, that it must be written as a tensor product? The, the, the row, the, the, this state? Sorry? Row, oh. row SE should be, one second. Ah, with the extractor? Yeah. So, so yeah. okay, so that's, that's um, so S, S is, a, is a uniform, um, so S, S is a, maybe let me just do it. It's um, just trying, trying to make it um, convenient for the notation. So S is a uniform, okay. So S, <laughs> so this row SE, right? Okay, so in fact, I could write it also as a row um, uniform over this, like the seed. So the seed, is, the seed is uniform, the seed is public. So I could also write here a row UL, tensor product row UD. So D is the size of the seed tensor product row, uh, row E, okay? So I could also write the, the, the tensor product here. I didn't write it just um, to, to, um, to kind of make, make it look uh, identical to the, to the secrecy definition. Um, and also one way of like, why do I write it like this? Is because I con the seed is being communicated over the public channel. Um, so the seed is, is part of Eve's information. Okay, so in the secrecy definition, I only had E, so I kind of include this S into the E. But this S and the E are uncorrelated there in tensor product. And the reason is that Alice is just choosing the seed at random. So this is a uniform seed. She is choosing it. She controls it. And then she communicates it to Bob and Eve gets to learn it. Okay, but, but there are no, because she is choosing it uniformly at random, there are no correlations between the seed and Eve's side information. Um, nevertheless, Eve can choose to use this seed, the information about the seed in order to um, make a measurement later if she wants on her quantum state. So this is kind of, I think of it as part of her information. Okay, so I mean, the short answer is there is a tensile, it's like it's a tensile product structure. Um, and this is why I write it like this. Mm 